All right, welcome back. It is another video about breaking down free response questions in AP Biology tests. If you haven't watched the other video about the steps that I use to break down AP Biology questions, definitely check out the other video. The link is right below here. So check out that video to understand how to break down AP Biology questions in four simple steps. We're gonna use those steps to break down long free response questions as well. So the process is the same no matter how long or how short the question happens to be. Step one is to first read all of the questions to find out how many things that I'm really going to have to answer, okay? Step number two is to locate and identify all of the command terms. Now, I do wanna offer this one caveat. I do know that evolution is not it's not on the 2020 exam. This exam was printed obviously before this all happened and so we'll answer this, we'll look at it anyways. After I've identified the command terms and I really understand what it is the question is asking me, I'm going to read everything. I'm going to look at the data table, I'm going to look at the text with these command terms in mind. So pause the video, read through the text, and see how you may begin to formulate your answer. All right, so now I am ready to begin answering part A. There's a template on the next page, and you're going to construct a graph using the data in this table. So I'm gonna pay close attention to the data in the table. What do I see? Well, I see a column that will be a treatment, I see the mean percent, okay, this is the percent, and I see the, the standard error, okay, so some adjustments that we can make. What I want to identify before I even start building a graph is what kind of graph, okay? It doesn't have anything to do with tracking changes over time. It has these different categories. I'm going to assume based on the data that this will be a bar graph. Okay, it's a bar graph because we're comparing different categories. The next thing that I want to do when I'm building a graph is to identify the dependent variable and the independent variable. The independent variable is one that doesn't change. I like to think of the independent variable as what specifically we're measuring. So that means that this information will go on the bottom of my graph that would be the x-axis. This information would go on the side of the graph or the y-axis, okay? And it's percentages. So these are all percent. The standard error will also be attached to this. All right, so now here we are with the graph and instead of having you watch me make a graph, I am gonna speed up this whole process and you can see what I do. Key elements that they'll be looking for is just making sure that everything is properly labeled, that you have units, and that it's the right kind of graph. So, here we go. Okay, so now that I have my graph constructed, did that relatively quickly, but you can see that I have the treatments on the x-axis, the mean percent of DNA with double strand breaks on the y-axis, and I made a legend so I could save some space at the bottom. This is a legend for the treatments, so A, B, C, and D are represented here. You can see what they mean. Okay, so that's it for part A. That's all I needed to do, is just to make a graph that represents the data shown in the table. Part B says using the results from all treatments, describe the effect of BAP alone and UVA alone compared with the effect of the combined treatment of BAP and UVA on DNA. BAP alone doesn't cause damage. 
that's this right here. And I can tell that that's true comparing it with our control, that there isn't much of a difference. The second thing is UVA alone doesn't cause damage. Again, it does look slightly higher if we look at just the data, but as I'm looking at the standard error as well, there's not enough significant difference to say that it's causing damage when compared with the control. Okay, the last thing is looking at the compared, uh, sorry, the combined treatment of BAP and UVA radiation, and this is significantly different, even taking into account the standard error. So we could say that BAP plus UVA caused damage, or you could say that it caused more damage than the individual treatments, and those treatments are here, B and C. Part C is asking us to predict the most likely effect on cell division for a cell containing DNA with double strand breaks and to justify your prediction. Okay, so that is going to have to tap into your original knowledge. If there's double strand breaks in the DNA, what that tells me is that the cell cycle will probably regulate those more heavily than cells that have normal functioning DNA. So let's look at how we might be able to answer this question. Okay, there's a couple things that you could say. You could just go the route and say altogether that cell division will not occur. The justification is that DNA can't be completed. You could say a justification would be that the cell won't pass through a cell cycle checkpoint with damaged DNA. And I'm going to stop here for just a moment because I'm writing a bulleted list. When you take the AP exam, this is not an appropriate way to answer questions. I'm doing it this way to save us some time. Okay, cell division won't occur because maybe DNA replication can't be completed or maybe because uh, the cell can't pass through the cell cycle checkpoint with damaged DNA or maybe you could say that with damaged DNA the cell, the cell will enter this programmed cell death which is apoptosis. The last part that we need to answer is here. Now this is making uh, kind of connections with the future. Point mutations alter the DNA sequence at a single nucleotide. What we want to do is describe how point mutations affect the genetic makeup of the population and impact the evolution of a population. Okay, so again, I know evolution is not on this exam, but we'll answer it for this case. So this one is going to be two, two points. Two points because we're describing genetic makeup of a population and we're describing the impact of the evolution of that population. So here we are for part D. With genetic makeup, point mutations alter the DNA sequence at a single nucleotide. Okay, let's do this. Again, I'm just going to write it in a chart form. Okay, with genetic makeup, let's see, a point mutation could do something like this. It could cause, point mutations could cause an increase in genetic diversity. A uh, genetic makeup effect could be that we might introduce new alleles with a point mutation. New alleles. Um, and maybe if there's new alleles, maybe we might say that it could introduce new proteins, perhaps. New proteins or amino acids. Okay, uh, let's maybe pause the video, not pause the video, let's maybe pause for a minute and remember what a point mutation is. A point mutation in DNA, so if this is, if this is a DNA sequence, a point mutation is changing just one of these letters. So instead of a T, maybe the mutation is G-A-A, T-A-C-A. -A. So we change the T to an A. It doesn't change things very significantly, especially if you remember that these are then coded in groups of three in RNA. So we would C-U-U, and this group of three is an amino acid. Usually the last letter, or just changing one letter in a codon, doesn't make a very big impact. But it could do things like this. 
Okay, so that's the genetic makeup side of things. Let's talk about the evolution. Okay, in terms of evolution, how could a point mutation alter the DNA sequence at a single nucleotide? How, how could that affect the evolution of a population? Well, it's kind of the same answer as these. So, new alleles could equal new phenotypes. Okay, and these new phenotypes are subject to natural selection. Okay, uh, what else? Maybe mutation is subject to the evolutionary forces, so we could say, we could just say that, that mutation is subject to evolutionary forces. And that's really the same idea that we set up here, just a little differently. Okay, and that's it, so that's part D. Those are all of the things that you needed to answer for this question. Let's uh, maybe come out a little bit. For this question, long free response on the AP exam. Now it took me about 20 minutes to do this as we were walking through everything. It's obviously going to be much shorter for you watching the video. So just know that you have two of these questions. One is a long free response question like this. One is a short free response question like this that we did in the last video and you have 45 minutes to do both of them. Okay, very best of luck, and we will see you when we see you.